Anyway, hello guys, welcome back. I'm Osena, and this is part two of the virtual interactive novel uh, known as Cupid. Last time we left off, we met this woman right here, or this girl, whose name is Rose, and apparently she's so beautiful that every man basically looks at her and she's been called a slut, a harlot, a whore. Basically all the nasty names under the sun. Her mother appears to be in her head, or that's what she appears to be guided by. Um, so much so that she cut out her own eye as penance for being this slut, even though she's done nothing wrong, as far as I can tell. Uh, we're at a French marquee party right now. This is him. We're about to find out what's going on in his life. And this is some little urchin girl who stole bread for us, and um, we ate it. So... Anyway, here we go. A young man strode to the commotion. A sweet scent lingered as he passed. The rose girl felt her, felt her mouth well up. His presence filled her body, almost as if her hunger was, uh, was abated. She blushed furiously. What a strange effect he had. Guillem? I think Guillem? I think that's how it's pronounced. Guillem. Ladies. Oh, so Guillem! I just came to check on my esteemed guests. Is everything alright? Are you enjoying yourselves? One of the ladies started fanning herself with, with obvious annoyance. Well, these little beasts have been harassing us. Yes, my lord. We were just minding our own business when this girl swiped the food off our table. Horrible little nits. The girl stuck her tongue out at them. I presume she means the little kid, not us. A lady wiped her eyes in mock tears. See? Look at that. It's absolutely monstrous how these children act around adults now. There is no respect, Monsieur. It is worry for the, I worry for the next generation. Oh, Charlotte, don't cry. Well, my lord, we would all breathe a little easier if these children were sent on their way. Yes, who knows what kind of mischief they might be up to. They might set fire to the tables, do you see? Oh. Or steal our jewellery. In fact, I think my pocket watch is missing. No. How unfortunate. One of the ladies continued her childish wailing. It is, monsieur! It's, unfor it's unfortunate how you allow your important guests to be treated this way. Please deal with these vermins. Throw them out now! Oh yes, my sweet ladies. I'm stricken with grief at your misfortune. Allow me to offer my heartfelt apologies. Unfortunately, this child is my important guest today. And you are, sad to say, poultry squatters. I excuse me, see, I like this dude. You can't see my face because I covered it. I covered the screen uh, with the game screen, which is what you guys can see. Um, but yeah, I like this guy. He's probably going to be an asshole. Excuse me, Madame Charlotte of Montpellier. I don't remember sending you an invite. Same for you, Lady Antoinette of Fren. And Lady Claudette of Lyon. Most people I invited are huge patrons of music. This is why they're here today. They came to listen to Mademoiselle Catherine Louise Peride. She is the seven year old piano prodigy who played for the Queen last summer. Oh, he's basically making it up for her sake. I think. The man pointed at the girl busy chewing her half of the bread. The rose girl just stared at the unfolding situation. Well, well, that's... I'm sure you are aware of that, were you not? Uh, uh, uh. No matter. I'm always happy to see you, ladies. It is my pleasure to have you here. But I hope you don't mind giving some of the food away to, the to my townspeople. That's why I keep my gates open. My servers are instructed to serve anyone who passes by, not just my guests. But... Don't fret, my darlings. There is plenty more to be served. The ladies blushed in embarrassment. One of them began to fan herself even faster. Excuse me. The Marquis walked up to the two girls. The Rose Girl's heart beat so fast that it made her head feel light and dizzy. She had never been this close to him. It made her, sh it made her feel a mixture of fear and elation. <coughs> Lady Catherine, your father has been looking for you. It is almost time for your performance. The girl looked up at the Marquis and did a little curtsy. My apologies, sire. I didn't mean to cause a clatter. Guillaume chuckled. 
I saw the whole thing, Ma Shelley. You put those ladies in their place. They were being mean to her. Guillem narrowed his eyes at the quiet girl. She hid behind her basket of roses. She couldn't look at him directly. He was like the sun. It hurt just to be in his presence. Yet there was relief in her heart as he stepped close to her. I haven't seen you before, have I? The rose girl nodded and made a curtsy. I I deliver roses to your house sometimes, sire. Hmm, yes, the girl with the sweetest face. The rose girl blushed. I love your roses, by the way. They stay fresh longer than they should. You've tended to them with love. Th thank you, sire. Do you have a name, young lady? I... Uh, I... Um... What's the matter? It's all... It is alright, young lady. If you would rather... Let's call her Rosa! Hmm? Rosa! It fits her! I think she forgot her name. Or sh she lost it. The Marquis nodded wisely. A valid point. Hmm. Are you alright with that, Rosa? Yes. Ah, oh, she's got a name now. we got a name. Yay! Come on, Rosa. You'll watch me play, right? I... Her eyes wandered from the girl to the marquee. Oh, Sir Gilly doesn't mind. Gilly. He's really nice to me and my family. And he helps the people around town, too. He won't throw you out. The marquee held his right hand in the air, as if swearing an oath. I won't. See? Come on, you're invited now. You're my special guest. There's plenty of food inside too, Rosa. Please help yourself. Thank you, sire. Rosa is coming. Yay! See, it's already taking a nice turn. I can't wait for it to go badly. Now, this is my first public performance, Rosa. I am a bit nervous. Catherine scratched her head. What will I do if I make a mistake? Papa will be very upset. Excuse me. The Marquis knelt in front of Catherine and rubbed her shoulders fondly. Uh, you won't make a mistake, Miss Shelley. As long as you put your heart into the keys. Play to touch your audience and any mistake won't matter. Do you understand? Catherine stared at the Marquis. Not really. The man chuckled. You will, someday. Just play your first song with me in your mind, will you? Something that will make... Something that you think will make me smile. Guillaume held Catherine's clear young eyes in his gaze. He kissed her hand. It was covered with sticky sugar and breadcrumbs. Catherine blushed. It was the first time she looked embarrassed by anything. I... It, it would be my pleasure, sir. Catherine chudged up the wooden podium and walked towards the middle of the stage. The crowd's chatter died down. She curtsied. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I thought that was someone at the door. <laughs> she curtsied in front of her audience, waved to her father and stole a glance at Guillaume. The man gave her a tiny nod. Oh, are we going to hear piano? She sat down in front of the piano, admiring the cream and ebony keys underneath her fingers. Her own piano was broken and beaten. Father had sold his horse for it. The A3 key never played, and the strings would creak when it was cold. But it had never failed her. She knew the keys like they were, own her, they were her own fingers. She whispered to the new piano softly, as if coaxing a beautiful, untamed animal. Let's be friends, okay? She saw Rosa at the far end of the podium, watching her diligently. There was a renewed vigour in her blood. She could hear the keys calling out to her. A song that would make him smile. She placed her fingers on the keys. She began to play. Right, there we go. <clears throat> At the ring of the first few notes, it became apparent to the audience that, the girl, that this girl was something special. Here was a little girl, barely tall enough to reach the pedals of the piano, playing as if she owned it. There were times she'd miss a note or two, but that didn't matter. She played the song to make someone smile, and it touched everyone present. Her musical skill was far beyond her years. Her fingers caressed the keys as if she was making a flower crown, carefully weaving the petals. She knew the correct way to 
tied the leaves so they wouldn't tear, like all smart little girls did. As the piano sang under her hands, Catherine seemed to disappear right in front of the audience's eyes. She was just a vision, after all, somebody leading them down a dream. A dream of a garden, the springtime, the shadow of a tree on a windy day. The couples in the audience tightened their grip on the hands of their partners. Some closed their eyes and let the music saturate their soul. Sweet memories of youth, a first love, the yawn of a newborn. Rose's eyes shone as she stared out at Catherine. Her heart was captured by this image of her. A young girl swaying ahead to the music, smiling as the notes poured out of her. She couldn't take her eyes away from Catherine's glowing face. Oh, this spacing on this is fucking terrible. Was this happiness? Was this love? She looked as like she was in love. And she was, wasn't she? In her innocence, she was still in love with life. In love with her family, with her pets, in love with every new discovery. She was full of hope. It was a bittersweet feeling for Rosa. A happy teardrop rolled down her cheek. She wanted to wa warm herself in that hope, if she could. In the audience, Guillaume and Catherine's father sat beside each other. Sire Pyride. Pyride? 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 Your daughter is amazing! She, Francois Pyride. She is, isn't she? I mean, pardon my arrogance, your liege. I, I am a very proud father, you see. No pardon necessary, sire. Has she found a sponsor? Shut up! Has she found a sponsor yet? The Duke of Versailles once spoke to me about it, but we have not made any arrangements. Then I must steal her away as soon as possible. Sire? I'd like to be Catherine's primary sponsor, if that's alright with you. Why, sire? And to further cement my status, the piano that she's playing right now, it is hers. I've bought it for her. Francois's eyes widened in astonishment. That, that is... Francois gulped. That is beyond generous, sire. Guillaume smiled. Well, I must make it hard for you to refuse me, you see. I took the opportunity of asking you outright. You see, the Duke might offer an extravagant piano plated in gold. In that case, I have no choice but to humbly concede. But what? I'm kidding. The Duke of Versailles is the worst miser you will ever meet. The men chuckled. Of course, I should be paying for a musical tutoring as required, along with an ample stipend to accommodate your family. Uh, you don't have to look so surprised, Monsieur Pilet. Your daughter is a star. There is an effervescence about her that enraptures the soul. There is no doubt in my mind that she will succeed. Thank you deeply, my liege. Please call me by my name, Monsieur. Let me remind you that generosity isn't without charge. Her tutoring will be done at my house. I want to monitor her progress. Apart from that, I'd like very much I'd very much like Catherine to visit me and play from time to time. Oh god. From the dark opening to this story we've had, this does not look good. Music is one of my true passions. Her presence would benefit my mood tenfold. Of course, sire. That is but a small price to pay for all your offers. On the contrary, Monsieur. You don't have to decide now. Can't you think about it? Th thank you, my lord. Sire Guillaume. After the performance, Catherine and Rosa went to the Marquis' garden to play. <coughs> Excuse me. Francois and Guillaume lingered on their table, sorting out the details of Catherine's further education. Emily Pilade watched about the wandered about the crowd, searching for a familiar face. She had arrived halfway through Catherine's performance, just in time to gush at her little daughter's uh, little sister's applause. Unfortunately, she couldn't find her father in the crowd. When she finally caught sight of the back of his head, she approached him hastily. Father, there you are! I've been looking all over for you! Emily stopped as she saw the man her father was talking to. It was none other than the Marquis himself. She fixed her hair self-consciously and curtsied. My lord, pardon my intrusion. I didn't realise... Guillaume smiled at her kindly. You are free to intrude any time, my lady. Emily smiled back. Just as the rumour said, the Marquis was easy on the eyes. To whom do I owe the pleasure of your acquaintance? 
This smile this daughter, Emily, pardon me for not introducing her sooner. Charmed. Gem. Gem offered oh, the spacing on this is terrible and it fucks my eyes up. Gem offered her a seat. Emily sat down across the man. Well it seemed talent and good looks run in the family. Francois rubbed his neck. Yes, my daughter and my pride and joy. Thankfully they both look like look after their mother. Surely not, Monsieur Poet. The eyes are yours, earnest and loving eyes. Emily snorted at such happy at such sappy words. Her father was clearly basking in the compliments. If this was really the famous Guillaume the rumours talked about, then he wasn't exactly much of a charmer, was he? She didn't know what all the fuss was about. The ladies in the house she worked for could not seem to stop talking about this man. Admittedly, there was something morbidly curious about the way he looked at people. Like he was always distracted and could only say words that were expected of him. I am pleased to have finally met you, sire. I've heard a lot about you on my travels. All good things, I hope. Depends on the tabloid and the day of the week. Emily thought to herself and chuckled. You are a governess, I was told. Where do you work? With the Dimitri household, sire. Ah, yes, I heard you were marrying into the family soon. Oh, father, I told you not to tell anybody yet. I didn't, but you know how people talk. World travels fast. Pardon the comment, then, my lady. Please. Your betrothed is a lucky man, I'm sure. The conversation endured throughout the afternoon. Small talk, musical components, their little town, Catherine's musical background, Francois' students, Emily's work. Emily played with a napkin, offering droll opinions on the particularly droll topics. All throughout the exchange, Emily observed the infamous Marquis de Gaulle. This was him? The audacious, shameless flirt of the royal court and tabloids. <clears throat> According to the rumours, he was able to bear both the widow Countess of Devonshire and her daughter. Fair play. At the same time, definitely fair play, brother. <clears throat> and even had a turn to molt... Oh, fuck's sake. Tumultuous, tumultuous relationship with the Prince, uh, Prince of Garnet. What? Interesting. He didn't limit himself to royalty, so also the tabloids said. His latest flirting was with an English poet, who they say almost killed him when he was when he was caught with another man or a woman. Ah, at this point, who knew what was real and what was a blatant lie made up by the newspapers? As is often true in newspapers. She had looked forward to meeting him, and here he was, finally, talking about sampling the new bakery's creme brulee. She couldn't say anything, she couldn't say she was disappointed exactly, but the Marquis was a depressingly normal man. Maybe even boring, Emily ventured. She watched as his gaze flickered across her hair and her nose before lazily training away. How infuriating. She wondered if he would suddenly say something coy, or insist to dance with her. Just something outrageous. Honestly, so she could shoot him down. This man, whom everyone was interested in, that would be a small victory for a reasonable woman everywhere. But the Marquis was nothing but polite. He did not ogle, he did not touch her necessarily, no audacious gestures, suggestive winks of the eye. He would not even look at her for more than two seconds. So, you're pissed off that he's not a perverted pig? I, I... Maybe she was not pretty enough to flirt with. Emily bit her lip. She shouldn't be thinking that. But... There was also... There were also times that he would look quietly into her eyes when the conversation lulled. When the words spoken were without meaning, their eyes would converse further. Oh! Oh God, he's evolving! To Emily, he'd started to look lonely underneath the facade of Caprice. He seemed tired of Libby Ga of. He seemed tired of. What the? Oh, is that just my screen? It is just my screen. <sighs> he seemed tired of all the gallivanting, the rumours, and the numerous flings. We're all a little lonely, aren't we? Perhaps even he. He invited the family of his. He invited the family over to his chateau 
and commented on how empty the building felt sometimes. Music was his guilty pleasure. That's <sighs> great, you're on the record, that's going well. It got him through the cold nights, he said with a sad grin. How he wouldn't mind a warm soul to touch. And before she could stop herself, Emily began to imagine his lips on her neck. On one of those cold nights. One of my ah. Emily shook her head, trying to erase the thought of her in her mind. They were having a perfectly mundane conversation. She didn't know where these thoughts had come from. Unfortunately, her father didn't seem to notice. Music and loneliness struck a nerve with Francois Parade. <laughs> he had immersed himself in his music, tutoring his students and Catherine ever since his wife had gotten sick. It had been six years, but sometimes the nights were cold. For Francois, the Marquis was speaking to his soul. He was a kindred spirit. He wasn't a pompous showboat like all the other royalty Catherine had played for. The Marquis even had a wine collection he wanted to show Francois. Such a down-to-earth, generous young man. Emily, your face is flushed. Are you alright? I'm fine. Just the sun, probably. This was not true, of course. The afternoon sun had already lost most of its heat. Thankfully, Catherine provided the distraction. She ran towards their little huddle and flung her arms around her father's torso, chattering happily about gardens and butterflies. A young, ragged girl followed behind her. Emily wasn't sure how old the girl was. Her dirty blonde hair hid the left side of her face. You could just see the faint traces of scars peeking through. A surge of motherly affection caught hold of her heart. Hello there, young lady. The girl looked down at her toes, but she gave a shy smile. I've seen you make I see you've made a crown of flowers. You look very pretty. Thank you, madame. Catherine gave it to me. Sister, this is Rosa. She's really nice. She knows the names of all the flowers in Sir Giddy's garden. Catherine, there you go again with your silly names. Sister, help me convince Papa to let Rosa stay with us. Catherine? Papa, please, please let her stay with us. She doesn't have anywhere to go. Now, Catherine, that is not very nice. Rosa here is a girl. She's not a kitten you can just pluck from the street and take home, like you do with all stray animals. Goodness knows how we we ha goodness knows we have all the stray cats of France living in our house. Yes, I know, but she's not a kitten. I know she's a girl. But shouldn't we take her home even more so? Francois sighed. Guillaume chuckled under his breath. He was clearly enjoying this exchange. Your daughter is, has some very unique views, Sir Pirade. Or Pirade. Well, Sir Giddy, what do you think? Huh? Guillaume's face lost its casual bystander look. You're a Marquis. I'm sure my father would follow your orders, right? Shouldn't we take Rosa home? Guillaume's brows furrowed at being put on the spot so suddenly. He stole a glance at Francois, who was silently pleading him with his eyes not to humour the child. He cleared his throat. Well, I'm sure it's up to your father, since he, he owns the house. He will have to clo clothe and feed Rosa, you see. Yes, but I've got all that figured out. Ever since sister moved to work, nobody minds the house anymore. And I have to wash the dishes every time. Ugh. Papa's so busy, and we always have enough food for the two of us. If Rosa stays, then I wouldn't be so lonely on my own. She'll wear sister's old clothes and will mind the house when both sister and father are away. She can wash the dishes sometimes, and I'll wash them sometimes. Gemma Francois shared a look. And besides, if it were up to me, I'd have people take one girl home in their house and give her food. That makes no sense. Girls don't even eat that much. Not sure about boys. <coughs> she thought for a bit. But I'm sure it's not too much that people can't take them home too. One time, I ate a whole plate of potatoes and my stomach hurt. Greedy bitch. If Rosa was there, I wouldn't have eaten so much. Maybe. Gem couldn't help but laugh as Francois rubbed his neck in embarrassment. I'm so sorry, she's very headstrong. Father, I'm sure taking Rosa in wouldn't be much trouble for us financially, yes? My new work pays better. I'm sure we can adjust. Well, about that. Perhaps if Rosa works in my household, it wouldn't be much of a burden for your family, Sire Parade. 
Sir Gilly is great. You truly are a kind soul, sire. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Not at all. I'm sure I need her help more than she needs mine. Isn't that right, Rosa? In that case, I would love to offer my home to Rosa. Although I'm still worried that this is supposed to be more complicated, sire. What about her family? Or her friends? Aren't we violating any laws, perhaps? I'm not even sure. As long as it is consensual, sire, the details can be smoothed out later. The girl was quiet the whole time. She was looking at her toes, or at Catherine. Son of a bitch, I'm sorry. <coughs> Rosa, do you have any family, relatives, or friends that you stay with? No, sire. My mother died a long time ago. But she guides me always. So please, don't be compelled to mind me. No, don't go back to the streets, Rosa. It's September. It's going to be really cold soon. Sir Gilly will even give you work. Stay with us. But Catherine, Francois, sighed in surrender. All right, all right. She can stay for the night. But just for tonight. Then we'll see if she wants to stay for longer. Catherine, you cannot hold people in their place just because you want them there. Do you understand? If Rosa wants to leave, she may leave. You cannot keep her like she's an object. Guillaume cleared his throat. That is sound advice, Sire Pyridae. Yes, Papa, I understand. Rosa, please make yourself comfortable in our home. Th thank you. Papa is the best. Catherine turned to Guillaume again. So, Gilly, don't you think if everyone with a house takes one person home, nobody would freeze in winter? You should make it into a law. They'll obey you because you're a marquee. And because you're tall. What has height got to do with anything? Oh, so people obey my orders because I'm tall. What a compliment. Well, you're taller than my papa, at least. He'll never be a marquee. <laughs> Francois pulled on his daughter's ear with embarrassment. Catherine, mind your manners. I'm so sorry, sire. Gem shook his head, his eyes training over the parody family. Only watched him curiously. That same sadness once again surfaced for the briefest moment. You have a lovely family, sire. I'm quite jealous. <coughs> you make me want to settle down myself someday. He chuckled. Maybe. Emily's heart skipped a beat. Did he just look at her when he said that? She couldn't be sure. Catherine is perfect the way she is. It's one of the reasons why I am very invested in her. Gien knelt down so that she was so that he was eye to eye with Catherine. He passed her head. You are a very intelligent and kind-hearted girl, Catherine. You are a star. Mon étoile. Someday I know you will change the world. At least I'd like to see you try. Mother. Oh. Help me. My chest. I can't breathe. No. no. Ca Catherine. Oh, fuck. Ah. Oh, God. The fuck? And here I just thought it was going to be boring. Like, we just... I, I just read an entire chapter of this virtual novel and nothing happened. All I did was click and read and click and read. And now... It looks like somebody's hung themselves. So... Hopefully that's not how this book turns out. I really hate books with sad endings. It's, it's safe. We'll go there. And done. Right. What's funny? What is funny? Right. I was going to stop this. I was going to stop recording this series because I didn't think it was really going to go anywhere. Um, but now I kind of want to carry on. So with that in mind, <coughs> I will see you guys for part three of Cupid, the virtual novel which was free to play on Steam. I'm sure it is still free. Um, I will see you guys later. Cheers, guys. Bye.